Hi, this is John Harper, Summit County reporter for Northeast Ohio Media Group. Tonight, we're going to be seeing a debate between two Akron City Council candidates, uh, Cynthia Blake from the Republican Party, who's mm -hmm. running in the at-large council race, and Scott Thanasu, who is running in the Ward 7 race as an independent. We're going to ask a series of questions tonight. Each candidate will have uh, two minutes to respond. But first, uh, we'll have the candidates introduce themselves. Cynthia, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your background professionally, uh, politically, if you have any, and then why you decided this year to run in the uh, Akron City Council at large race. Well, you know, John, I'll be happy to. And thanks, first of all, for having me here this evening. But uh, my name is Cynthia Blake. I was born and raised in Akron, Ohio. I, attend, uh, I attended Akron Public Schools as well as Springfield Local Schools, the University of Akron, and Texas Southern University uh, in Houston, Texas. Um, I am running for the city council at large race um, because I have been attending the meetings downtown on a regular basis. And I just noticed that there was just an eerie feeling about things going on. And I've always taken an interest in um, uh, local government based off of my professional background, which is finance. For the past 30 years, I've worked two jobs. One is a part-time employee, as well as the finance arena uh, at, at PNC Bank and Bank One. And I had to, can I do that over again? I kind of got a little lost. Can I do that one over again? If you want to just go ahead and finish, what I'll do is I can I can go through and, and edit this. Yeah, because I kind of I'm, I'm, I wanted out. to go back to say what I was and then go back into the. Just um, just continue okay. where you want to leave off, and I'll close the gap. Okay, because she gave me the card and then I got nervous. Yeah, just just what, finish up the last 10, 15 seconds, whatever you wanted to say, and I'll I'll clean it up. Okay, and um, I just want people to know that I have been a true uh, community leader and I've had various leadership roles at, um, as a board of director with NeighborWorks and in Pride through Empowerment and Rural Housing Opportunity and I have the skill sets to do the job. All right, Mr. Fennessy, if you'd like to take a minute to just tell us a little bit about your background and why you decided to run in, in Ward 7 this year. Okay, um, my name is Scott Fennessy. And thank you all as well for inviting me to uh, this, this forum to discuss issues. Um, my background, I grew up in Akron. I was raised in Akron. And I attended Akron Public Schools as well for all of my primary and uh, secondary education. I graduated from Garfield High School. And uh, I attended the University of Akron for a time. And then uh, later joined the Navy. I served in the US Navy for eight years. And upon um, ending my service with the, with the Navy, I worked at AT&T for 11 years, during which time I used the GI Bill to go back to school and finish earning a degree in political science with a minor in economics. And I currently work in the Cleveland area for Great Lakes Fence. I grew up in Firestone Park, and the reason that I'm interested in running for city council in Ward 7 is that I, I grew up in Firestone Park. I moved back to Akron after uh, separating from the Navy, and I, I like the area, and I really care about Akron and my neighborhood, and I've just noticed that there are some areas where we could improve and bring about a uh, revitalization to some of our neighborhoods and, and improve the feel there. So, All right. Well, let's move on to our first question then. Certainly something over the last several years uh, that's been discussed a lot is the idea of building an arena in downtown Akron, which would complement Canal Park, uh, which opened quite a while ago, but a lot of people have, have credited for helping bring more people downtown. Uh, the question is, you know, would you support the construction of an arena downtown uh, as a city council person? What role do you think a downtown arena plays in, in the city's future? Uh, we'll start with, with Ms. Blake. Gosh, I always get to go first. Um, well, I would just have to honestly go ahead and answer that. No, I don't think a re an arena is needed right now for downtown. We are um, already under budget cuts or we need to look at all the finances first. And, you know, we have this other project, the sewer project going on, and we just need to really do some more uh, looking at what needs to really be done in the city of Akron right now. And, and an arena for downtown is not needed. And downtown does look nice. There's a lot of things that have that are vibing and energetic, you know, to bring the 
the University of Akron students down there and to bring people to downtown. Akron downtown is looking very good with the restaurants and the housing that it does provide down there right now. All right, Mr. Tennyson. I agree with, with Ms. Blake. I too would not be in favor of supporting an arena downtown. Uh, a few of the reasons I also agree with her on are that we have other priorities that I think are, are more substantial, uh, more important to the overall long-term welfare of our city and the region, uh, one of which being the sewer project, um, which we might discuss later, I'm not sure, or we can bring it up. But um, as far as eliminating the combined sewer overflows, but regarding a, an arena, I think that we have adequate facilities right now to deal with sporting events and concert events. The Akron Civic Theater is a tremendous resource and a, a beautiful venue for concerts and all kinds of uh, social and uh, other events. Um, Styles Field at the University of Akron is a great venue. The Rhodes Arena, although it is uh, very dated, um, the first lady was just there, and you know, so it does it does attract and um, accommodate some significant events. So I don't think an arena is really that high, or shouldn't be that high of a priority on our list of things to do right now. Uh, Ms. Blake, would you care to respond or follow up at all? Uh, no, I mean, he kind of uh, nailed it uh, the way that I would have uh, answered it as well. We need to get priority spending in order for the city of Akron and. I really can't even, you know, don't want to say what you're for or against until you have really all the information necessary to make an intelligent decision. I think that's what happens in the political arena. We make all these deals, you know, ahead of time, but we don't have all the information if it was in the best interest of the great, for the great citizens of Akron. And Mr. Thanos, do you have anything to add? I really agree with what she just said. I think that uh, in order to make um, long-term commitments to something like that, those kind of expenditures, you really need to have more of the facts. But um, based on, albeit limited knowledge that I have of that, uh, articles that I have read, read in the newspaper and the Beacon Journal, I don't think at this time it's something that I would be interested in supporting. All right, since we heard a lot about uh, the sewer project already, certainly uh, a big issue for the city right now is exactly how it's going to go about uh, completing its $1.4 billion estimated mandate from the Environmental Protection Agency to stop the sewers from overflowing into the, the Cuyahoga River, the Little Cuyahoga River. Uh, this is something that the city spent a long time trying to negotiate with the EPA before ending up in court. Um, and now some have said they've gotten kind of a short deal there, some plans to sort of try and rework that. Uh, how would you, uh, as, a, as a council person, like to see the city move forward with the sewer project? And, and how do you think the city can, can work to, to save money on that and to try and you know, minimize the impact that's going to have on people's sewer rates? Well, we'll start with you this time, Mr. Fantasy. That's fair. Um, well, I, first of all, I think that the EPA mandates, um, regardless of uh, the hardship that I think a lot of us in Akron are experiencing with increased water bills. Um, I know myself, my water bill has increased uh, nearly uh, threefold. So. That said, I think that it is extremely important to reduce these combined sewer overflows. I support the, the EPA's uh, decision that, that this needs to happen. The, the Great Lakes are a tremendous resource, not only for our community, but for the region and really the entire United States and, uh, and Canada. And um, to, that, to that question, I, this is a bit of a digression, but I did a, a research project with the University, University of Akron um, for the Summit County Metro Parks. And one of the things that we were able to determine was that natural green spaces help eliminate a lot of um, what becomes waste and stormwater uh, that finds its way into combined sewer overflow areas. And so I think that one thing that we could do is perhaps look at more environmentally friendly and sustainable ways of allowing rainwater to enter into the groundwater rather than be diverted into the sewers. And it might not necessarily um, be, that question might not necessarily be answered by large construction projects. Rather, we might be able to look at some permeable surfaces and more green spaces to do that. Ms. Blake. Um, I, would, I would first want to go down there to have access to the uh, information. And I think with the uh, EPA of what they have required for the city of Akron to do 
is just an unwarranted expenditure. It's just too much of a burden at one time for the great residents of the city of Akron. And I think it's going to take a relationship with our federal elected officials, uh, uh, Ryan Rainisi, uh, uh, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, and all of them to talk to some of the people at, in Alexandria, Virginia, that make these decisions uh, because it's been, I agreed with uh, the past administration for tying it up in court uh, to fight the EPA on what they did mandate for us. And I do want clean water, but we're the only city in the state of Ohio that has the high cost. And I just think it's going to really take more of our already elected federal officials to go and be motivated to do something for the citizens. Would you care to follow up at all, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, the, only, the only area where I, I would say that um, we might have some bit of a difference, and perhaps not if we look into it further, mm -hmm. is that I do think that we need to proceed sooner rather than later uh, regarding cleaning up the, the uh, combined sewer overflow district because we are far behind on that. And there are other cities throughout the country, throughout the United States, that do utilize permeable surfaces. Granted, some of those are um, better served in warmer climates than Northeast Ohio. But I think that that could be an area of technology development because this is an issue that is not going to go away without the development of a better technology. And what better way to um, bring more businesses to the Northeast Ohio region and the city of Akron and perhaps utilize the University of Akron's research departments to tackle this issue. Mm -hmm. Ms. Blake. Um, I agree with him on the um, bring Akron U in or bring whatever resources we can in that can give as much support as far as manufacturing or producing to make the project uh, work. I do agree with that. So with that said, um, I, would, I would like for the people on city council that we just have a better relationship with the current, uh, the new, whoever the new federal assigned judge will be as well. And I think that's where we could start at. Um, and that's what I would offer uh, being a city council member. Moving on, uh, certainly uh, the relationship between the city and its police department has been a big issue in a lot of cities, Cleveland being one of them, maybe Akron less so uh, in terms of, of some of the, the uh, conflicts we've had uh, over the police department in the city. But that being said, um, do you think Akron needs to do anything to reform its police department? Uh, if so, what would you change with, with how the police department functions in, in Akron? And we'll start with Ms. Blake. Okay, well, there's always room in, for uh, improvement. And yes, as we know, first of all, we have to be able to say that there is an issue, okay? And we need to be able to do whatever it takes to bridge the gap for police officers and the community. And I do know recently um, they have been getting out of the car uh, and walking the neighborhood to be more friendly. I mean, not to say that they weren't friendly, but to just be... Uh, to, to really get to know their community. That's been one of their things that they've been doing lately within the community. But yes, I would agree for uh, reform because there's a, uh, a way of their thinking that uh, might affect how they're doing their job. I know that uh, the one bishop at uh, the church of, uh, I can't think of his church, I don't know why it escaped me, he's teaching implicit bias, uh, a series uh, to, to police academies, you know, and he's uh, uh, Pastor Joey Johnson. He's from Akron, and I am all for whatever it takes to bring cohesiveness to the residents uh, in the city of Akron. And police officer is a hard job. I just attend a uh, meeting, it was a luncheon that uh, Officer uh, Lloyd Ford taught about uh, policing the community, and those are the things that I try to do to keep myself aware of what's going on in the community. Mr. Thompson. I agree, again, with, uh, with Ms. Blake, that um, there is definitely an issue uh, between, unfortunately, between the law enforcement agencies and many of our citizens that there doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, being a police officer is definitely a difficult and um, not only stressful, but a uh, trying job, I would imagine. I know several police officers, and I think that one of the things that um, we need to recognize is that they enter into service as law enforcement officials 
to do good. I think that they, they enter into service to, to try to, to be protectors and providers of a valuable service to our community, but throughout the process of the exposure to a lot of the difficulties, some of those stresses start to um, perhaps cause them to be not as effective as they otherwise might be. So there might be ways of um, training to uh, help police officers cope with some of the stresses of the job and better be able to relate to the community and also ha have this kind of awareness um, made throughout the community so that people are more aware of what police officers do day in and day out. I know in my neighborhood and talking with residents, one of the things that they requested is more police patrol to encourage a, a safer uh, neighborhood and reduce some of the small crimes. So they're very necessary in our community. Ms. Blake, would you care to follow up at all? Uh, yes, and again, I think once we're, we're given access to information to really find out what's going on um, and the breakdown uh, with the police officers in the community, I do believe that there should be a paid position for the police auditor, um, as uh, formerly said by um, the mayoral candidate, Eddie Siblin, and we would find probably some other weaknesses uh, or they would be exposed for the probably, we don't have enough police officers and they're overworked anyway. And that would probably be exposed, you know, um, by me attending the luncheon that was this week, again, taught by uh, Officer uh, Lloyd Ford with the uh, Community Welfare Forum that was just put on. You know, one of the suggestions was that we should have precincts, but I don't think we're, we, we have enough in our budget to even probably do that, but we do know it does need to be reformed. Mr. Penasu. I have no further comment on that. All right, well, we'll move on then. Mm -hmm. uh, this was an issue that came up uh, in the springtime uh, and in early summer was raised. Uh, something that the city council does, and this is not necessarily unique to Akron, but has been debated uh, across the region and in the state, is that city council often passes legislation under what's called an emergency measure. Uh, which allows a, a piece of legislation, a new law, to be passed after only one reading. Um, and in city charter otherwise requires that it's read three times uh, in council before being passed. Some have said that this is a disservice to the voters, that they don't have as much time to come in and comment. Others have said that given uh, the amount of information online, that it's better to move the legislation forward more quickly. That being said, you know, what's your position on the issue? Do you think city council should slow down and, and read more of its legislation through the, the full, normal, full uh, you know, three reading period, uh, or should things move you know, quickly? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Thanasu. Okay. Um, I think that expediting good legislation is always a good idea. I don't think that uh, slowing down the legislative process is uh, productive. However, uh, diligence should be given to um, having a better understanding of all legislation that is passed by council. And um, so I think that very limited use of emergency legislation should be utilized. Um, if, if it is something that is truly very transparent in nature and very necessary for the well-being of the city and our communities, then uh, I think that is something that, that could be utilized effectively but overuse, I think, does um, take away from the, the review process and input from citizens. So I think it should be used very limitedly, in a very limited way, I should say. Ms. Blake. Okay. Well, again, I've been attending meetings regularly, um, and not just this year, um, to city council. And I do know one of the favorite terms that is that they'll go that the report was favorable to the committee, <laughs> and, and I always trying to follow the agenda. but. It would uh, be a learning curve because sometimes some things do need to speed along and then sometimes we do need to be a part of the process. So it's, in some instances, it's, it, it might be needed and in some instances, like I say, they just don't have to slow it down because I would like to see good local government where we bring a piece of legislation that's introduced and the community is involved before it's hurried up and suspend and then it passes. I, I'm for both. I'm for both. So sometimes some legislation does need to move, but sometimes you do need to hear from the public. And I want to be the type of uh, city council member that brings the ideas back to the people. That's what I want to be. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Tennessee, would you care to follow up with that? It sounds as though we agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we'll move on then. Uh, the next question we have here um, is, you know, given some of the major projects uh, that have taken place in the city over the last 10, 20 years, new schools, baseball stadium, convention center coming in, just, just to name a few, those things are now starting to slow down, come to a close. Uh, you have a few schools maybe left in, in uh, the, the former mayor's school program. What can be done to continue economic growth and, and to continue to, to fuel economic growth in the city? Uh, maybe without as many, you know, big projects going on, save, of course, for the sewer project. Um, you know, what, what would you advocate as a council person that the city do to, to help, uh, you know, attract more jobs and, and you know, get more, more money into the local economy? Uh, we'll start with, with you, Ms. Blake. Okay. Well, uh, I would look at small businesses. You know, we have to find out what barriers they have to try to remove them because they can help jumpstart your economy. Um, and then with the sewer project, uh, to hire as many residents as, you know, I hope that this contractor that they that did get the bid is um, open to hiring as many uh, city residents as, as they can and get them trained to get them on that particular project. And then just listen to people to find out what the need is, again, in the business uh, arena, you know, work with the uh, commerce uh, de uh, uh, department there, um, and just find out what the barriers are again to remove for small businesses to get them to come in here to be interested in Akron. Mr. Tennessee. I think that um, economic growth, well, I don't think actually, I, I know that uh, one of the key and most um, forceful driving agents of economic growth are revolutions in technology. Uh, every time we have a technological revolution, it spurs growth. And I think that having a, a wealth of um, research facilities available at the University of Akron, not far away at uh, Kent State, we also have other um, colleges and universities in the region, but focusing on our university, the University of Akron, um, I think that we can develop new technologies. We can look into some of the surfaces that I talked about for permeable surfaces to reduce stormwater runoff, as well as Look into energy development technology. Look into um, creating products that will become needed in, in the future and that are needed now to revolutionize our, our growing demand for energy. That can happen here. Um, Akron has been a powerhouse of innovation in the last century and a half. And while that has stalled for, for a period, that there's no reason why that can't reoccur. Uh, we just need to invest in education and um, attract the, the kind of ideas that, that would look to develop technologies here. Mm -hmm. Ms. Blake, would you care to follow up? Well, uh, again, it's about thinking out of the box, because uh, I had a moment there to think. Um, and again, support, find whatever, whatever can be manufactured to support the sewer project here. We need to try to find out what it can be and remove whatever barriers to get it done. Again, that can help bring uh, jobs to people here uh, in the community. Mr. Fenazu, any more to add? No further comment. All right. Uh, another issue uh, that was real big this year in City Council. Yeah, it was 550. 550. Okay, well, this will be our last question. Okay. Uh, another big issue in City Council has been uh, whether or not the city should actively hire more felons. Um, and so this came up uh, a couple times this year. Certainly a couple of years ago, the, the city already passed some legislation to quote unquote ban the box, which changed how the applications for city positions looked uh, to try and allow more people who are maybe returning from prison uh, a chance at some of these jobs. Uh, that being said, some on council proposed doing more to, to reform the, the application process that, that uh, they feel excludes some of these people without giving them a, really a chance. Um, so, you know, the question is, sh should the city actively hire more felons? And, and you know, what, what can be done to improve employment rates in some of the poorer neighborhoods where you do see some, some very high unemployment rates uh, around the city? Uh, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Thanasson. Okay. I think that... Uh, we do need to look at ways to hire more felons, to be quite frank. Um, and while to some people who don't, uh, might not initially agree with me, they might look at that as a scary prospect. I think that the scarier prospect is not allowing people who have
paid their debt to society to return to society as productive members because recidivism is due to circumstances that do not change. And if felons are not allowed to become active and viable members of our community through entering the workforce, you are not allowing them to contribute to society. And then, so what other, uh, what else is going to happen? They're going to remain unemployed and the likelihood of uh, returning to criminal activity is dramatically increased. Whereas if they have an opportunity to be constructive members of society and get a job, then that is less likely to happen and they can contribute. Um, I think everyone deserves a chance to do, to do good in their life and sometimes people make mistakes. That said, I think we need to be careful and install um, safeguards, some kind of checks, maybe perhaps look at uh, uh, ways of evaluating people psychologically to make sure that they are you know, put into positions where there is no danger to, to other citizens. But I think it, they deserve a chance. Ms. Blake. Um, I most definitely agree that they should try to hire uh, felons. Um, I not only follow city legislation about removing the box, but even at the state level, I'm following House Bill 56 right now that just went through the House and is in the Senate um, to uh, remove the box as well. Um, people need opportunity. And once again, like he said, when they pay their debt to society, they should be given opportunity. A lot of what's going on in the uh, inner city areas, uh, you can relate, it, relate that or attach it to uh, violence and everything and crime is going on because they don't have opportunities. And without any questions said, yeah, remove the box and hire felons. Any more to add, Mr. Pemsey? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How much time do we have? Um, it's 5.54. 5.54. Well, I wanted to give you guys a chance and, and without, you know, getting too long in, in, in doing, you know, rebuttals and everything. One more question I want to have you guys ask just because I want to use it from, from the other candidates is uh, something that's been discussed quite a bit, uh, not only in council but in the mayoral debate, is the city's role in economic development. So, uh, you know, one issue that sort of lingered for a long time in the Highland Square neighborhood was the property where Mustard Seed Market is located. Uh, the city had owned that property for quite a while, had had acquired it uh, in hopes of attracting some, some uh, new grocery store, some type of retail into that area, and it was unfilled for quite a while. Uh, in the mayoral debate, mayoral debate earlier this month, uh, Mr. Siplin uh, advocated that this is a bad way to do, to do economic development, that it puts you know, taxpayers you know, on the line if that uh, tenant decides to leave the building. Uh, but you know, Mr. Horgan said, hey, the city really needs to do all it can, and, and we should really look at Highland Square and what's been done there as a model uh, for, for how to do economic development in the city. That being said, what do you think the city's role in, in economic development and, and business development should, should be? And we'll start uh, this with Ms. Blake. Okay, as far as with the um, Highland Square project, yes, and that, it, I, I know exactly where that project is, and it was a new building that was there already, and then it was knocked down, and so, I mean, we were just wondering, or I know I used to always wonder from driving by there, but it's a commercial lease that the city is doing to Mustard Seed, and it's, uh, I guess, a new, innovative, creative way to bring businesses into the city. But our role is to create an environment for a business to come. If they felt, I guess, that the citizens over there felt that they should have or they needed it. I don't know if they did try to talk to other business uh, food chain owners that were already in existence. Um, you know, Acme was right down the street or Dave's. I don't know if other people had opportunities. I don't know all of the ramifications of it, but I don't, I, I just think sometimes if the citizens want something, we have to do whatever it takes to meet the citizens' needs. But our job should really be to just create the environment, but not be in these leases uh, that could put us on the hook or if it's not a successful business or something and then cause further debt. That part I do agree with. Mr. Fennison. I think it sounds like we philosophically agree that uh, government should not necessarily be in the business of supporting individual businesses. Mm -hmm. That said, government has a role in creating an environment for businesses to thrive. 
And so I know that the mustard seed is uh, in Highland Square is a, right now it's an asset to the community. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it will continue to be an asset. Um, I would like to see, for example, in my community, my neighborhood community in Ward 7 in Firestone Park, there's a business district on Astor Avenue. And that is one of the um, key points of my platform that, that I would like to see that area revitalized. And if we on city council, if, if I'm elected, can help create an environment not only in other parts of the city, but specifically, I, I would hope to represent my ward, uh, create an environment that welcomes and supports the businesses that exist there, but also attracts businesses that would uh, add to the neighborhood feel. They would allow people who live in Ward 7 to enjoy an area in their neighborhood rather than have to drive across town to do so. All right. Well, that being said, um, if you guys would like to either ask each other a question or propose a general question, you, you can. Uh, I was just going to piggyback a little bit off of what he had said about the support that um, if we're going to be in that type of business of doing this commercial leasing, you know, be fair to the businesses that are already there, you know, because I live in a neighborhood where a store had to close. If they had that sweet deal, they probably would not have had to close. So we need to be cognizant and be fair about all the different business districts. I think it's 14 of them for the city of Akron. We need to be fair to support the ones that are in existence right now as well. I agree. Yeah. Would you guys like to ask you a, a general question or if you want to give a, a closing statement, this is kind of your time to, to take, the, take the stage uh, and, and close well, things out for us. <laughs> well, earlier when they first asked me my question, they asked me a little bit about my background and. I wanted to give a little bit more in depth, you know, about saying how I was born and raised, and I do have two children, and I come from a family that is an advocate of uh, education, and as well as I attend public schools, and my children uh, attend public schools. But I have a strong finance background uh, out of the banking arena. I was a senior mortgage lender in community development for the past 30 years, as well as a corporate uh, court representative on a mediation team, and I have been in various leadership roles as a board of directors and working with nonprofit agencies. So I understand budgeting and finance and I would be a good candidate, I mean a good city council member. So on November 3rd, please make no mistake, vote for Blake. <laughs> All right, Mr. Tanazu. I would just like to uh, ask for your, vote, your vote on November 3rd, um, everyone who lives in Ward 7. I grew up as I said, in Firestone Park, which is right in, almost in the middle of Ward 7. And I went to public schools, so did my three children. Well, one of them is still in, in a public school in, the, in Akron. And uh, my wife and I both graduated from Garfield. And um, I just, I would like to bring some development to our community to address some of the issues that my neighbors have brought up about minor crime, but still when you're affected by crime, it, it, it hurts. And if, if your car gets broken into or if someone breaks into your neighbor's home, it's a concern. And while it's not rampant in, in my neighborhood, I've had several, uh, several neighbors complain about that, and I think that that's something that we, we can look at. Um, recently asked by the League of Women Voters to um, address what was the most pressing issue, I would say in all neighborhoods, it's property value. And one way to, to do that is to uh, address issues in our local schools, um, improve our middle schools and businesses in our, in our area that are conducive to a neighborhood feel. All right. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us uh, for our Northeast Ohio Media Group Akron City Council Debates. Please remember to go out and vote on November 3rd.